Hello again. Now we are move. We will move to the blue side of cyber power, uh, but for a moment. <laughs> and with Christopher, we will uh, review key findings from this year's SOC survey. Uh, hello, Christopher. Hey. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great, thank you. How are you doing? Perfect, thank you. Uh, so I leave you with our audience, and the stage is yours. Great, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody who's uh, tuned in for this. I really appreciate it. I'm going to talk quite a bit about the uh, cybersecurity operations and the uh, the SOC survey that I've been writing for the last seven years. Uh, so just so you know me, I work as a consultant. I have a class that I wrote uh, in 2016 on cybersecurity operation centers, how to build them and run them. Um, I've been writing the SOC survey since 2017. Um, I teach for SANS Institute. I work uh, as a you know contractor and a consultant and have done this in uh, a number of different s sectors. Um, and if you find me on LinkedIn and you'd like to connect there, um, you're welcome to do so. So let me get into uh, some of the details on the survey itself. Uh, this is I'm, I'm going to talk through some of the findings that I had, but just to set the stage of where that is, there were 641 respondents and each one of them, there was a mean time of 59 minutes in order to take the survey. So there are tons of questions, lots of information. And in fact, a lot of the people who take it tell me that they derive a lot of value from going through the questioning. The other thing that I've done since 2020 for this is I actually released the raw data set and a Jupyter Lab notebook that goes along with that data set in order to potentially answer some questions that you might have. So as I go through the analysis, there are a number of things that you might think, oh, well, did he do that in this way? Or how did he come up with that? Or maybe you wanted to focus on uh, companies that have headquarters in Europe as opposed to the, the stuff all around the world with the de-identified data set and the Jupyter Lab notebook as a boost to start. Um, you can do some of that analysis yourself if it's something that you're interested in. Because this is uh, primarily run with the SANS Institute um, out, of, uh, out of Bethesda, Maryland, um, there is a heavy uh, sort of focus on North America with the majority of the headquarters of the companies being in the United States. What was interesting though, is that uh, last year we actually ran it in both Portuguese and Japanese uh, for uh, alternate language support. And when we did that, it actually shifted second place of the headquarters from Europe to South America. And so what I'm finding is, is I'm trying to explore what people are doing in cybersecurity operations globally that it really depends on having the number one outreach and awareness of people uh, having this survey and being able to read it and see what value there is in it, as well as reaching people in their uh, in their language. So this is something that is uh, is interesting. I also did it in Japanese. Uh, so there was a, a section that was just uh, Japanese, uh, same questions, but uh, targeted at Japanese audience. So getting into some of the things that we found, um, the, the first part of this is what capabilities cybersecurity operations centers tend to have. Uh, it seems sort of uh, obvious, but I'm going to uh, talk through some of them because I don't want to uh, make assumptions. I want to be able to cite that there are certain things that are done. Alerting, compliance support, data protection, digital forensics, uh, these uh, are at the top of the list in terms of what people uh, what people do. Um, and you can see here in the chart that there's a combination of things which are outsourced, things which are done that are both outsourced and internal um, or exclusively internal. So we gave people the options for it. Consistent across the uh, several years that I've run this survey, um, pen test, purple team, red team, these are all consistently at the lower end of the capabilities, but strongly present in what people are saying that they do in their SOC. And it's interesting um, in this particular, uh, you know, pen test, red team, um, purple team, a lot of it tends to be substantially more outsourced. I'll come back to some of the topics of outsourcing and capability in a minute. Another thing was that uh, in the survey set, 
that we asked people, there was actually a substantial number who said that they detected incidents before external notification. And as you know, some of the prevailing information that's in the uh, industry trade press says that um, a lot of the incidents are actually discovered by third parties and then uh, the, the people are notified by the third party. But the group that responded to this said that they had a substantial volume of incidents that were detected through their monitoring and alerting. Another thing that's interesting around this to me is that the majority of their detections were actually monitoring and alerting as opposed to hunting. And so uh, that could be that they've got security, uh, you know, detection engineering um, really nailed and they're doing great things with it, or they don't have mature hunting programs uh, that are allowing them to do uh, detections and collections. In terms of uh, some of the key findings that I saw in the uh, in in the content, 84% uh, of socks collect and expose metrics. Uh, the top three that were actually uh, reported on the idea of the um, quantity of incidents. I hate this metric. I, I think it's actually um, almost meaningless, um, but it's the top one that everybody always says that uh, that they have. We had 74 incidents. We had three incidents. I have no idea what's good or bad. I want to figure out what the right number of incidents is and find them, but people tend to just focus on count. Time from detect to eradicate. I think this is a good one. Uh, it might run the risk of having people overly focus on time instead of having them focus on what the uh, the actual um, root cause is and if they have completely eradicated, because unfortunately people will eradicate and, excuse me, will say they eradicated, but they actually didn't. Uh, the other is the ratio of incidents from known to unknown vulnerabilities. This is an interesting one. The idea that you can actually assess that, yeah, we were exposed there and we let it go and we uh, took a risk and we actually were impacted by that. And a lot of things that happen in cybersecurity, it's actually from known misconfigurations and so on, but uh, a metric measuring whether this was something that you knew about and took the risk versus something that you didn't know about and it was brought to light as a result of, uh, of an incident is an interesting metric. Something that a lot of people struggle with is uh, how to ingest the data, how that data is actually um, you know, collected, but then more so which data to collect. So the idea of data collection and then ingestion into the SIM can be an actual uh, you know, substantial challenge. I think that uh, the, uh, you know, the other thing that a lot of people are doing is focusing on their, uh, on their tuning for their SOAR. Um, and so the continual tuning of SOAR by skilled analysts um, is something that was actually, uh, was actually uh, the, the, uh, the top answer. And in this case, it's the SOAR analysts who are actually implementing the, uh, the changes. Now, I don't necessarily love that uh, from, the, uh, from sort of the administrative management oversight, but the fact that people who are implementing SOAR are actually actively making changes is really positive. And from the from the responses that were there, about 60%, you know, that uh, that said that they're actively changing the SOAR. The 26% said they have a dedicated analyst whose task it is to actually tune the SOAR. Um, and then the 35-ish percent said that they have uh, analysts who are empowered to make changes. As I was saying, the um, the SIM is something where all of the data actually goes into. And the SIM, people have to choose what data should uh, be included into it. So we asked them uh, how you decide what data is ingested into your SOC. Uh, and their most common answer was everything goes into the SIM or syslog. Sort of this, uh, we just collect it all and then figure it out. Uh, that seems inefficient to me on the one hand because you're paying for stuff that you're not ending up using. On the other hand, it actually is a, is a valid approach from the perspective of, I don't know what data I'm going to need and I will spend the extra money and minimize my thinking and my time and my effort and just put it all in the SIM. And then it's there. 
The only challenge with this, of course, is when you get into enormous environments and you have massive data troves of terabytes of data um, that are ingested, and then you have to have adequate performance to be able to search through all of that. So what I have found is that uh, a, a number of organizations, and the number is almost equal, is that they're actually applying this sort of risk-based selection based on, uh, based on their understanding of what exposure they have in order to be able to say this is the right data that goes into our uh, into our sim some people are doing this based on system prioritization and uh, other ones as well another thing that we asked about is budget and how do you get it and how do you uh, how do you secure it and there are actually several questions around this um, but this is uh, the most popular answer by far, is that the management above the SOC is actually taking recommendations from the SOC leads and managers, but the business management ultimately decides how funding is going to be allocated. And oftentimes this is done against the SOC manager's uh, recommendations. I'm not surprised by this at all. Uh, part of my prevailing thinking about security operations is that we provide loss prevention. The organization does something and we offer the promise of potential loss prevention. And we're not actually able to even guarantee that we're going to stop things. And so what ends up happening is we are perceived as a cost center. Our adversaries who are stealing information, directly stealing funds, um, or positioning in order to be able to uh, have either geopolitical influence or um, intellectual property control of assets that they have attacked an organization and extracted either that money directly or some sort of intellectual property to advance their business, they operate as a profit entity for their company or organization or government or whoever is funding them. And what ends up happening is, our business decision makers need to think about the business investment that they're making and then the loss prevention that they're funding and that loss prevention is us in the defensive side that loss prevention that they're funding in order to see is it worth it to keep putting more money into the loss if we're losing ground in the business side that makes it to where we might be at risk of either um, going out of business or failing to deliver on our mission because we don't have adequate resources. And so this then speaks to the idea of having the right sort of blend of risk management within our organizations. So part of the way that we're actually able to accomplish a perspective of risk is an ongoing set of testing. And so uh, the key finding in the outsourcing space is that pen testing and all of its variants and forensics and all of the variants around that are very frequently outsourced. The other thing that's interesting about this is that the things that people reported that they tended to outsource were also less likely to be done. And so this chart is actually a little bit difficult to uh, digest initially, but what we did was the red is the outsource rank. And this is an order, pen testing, red teaming, purple team, digital forensics, threat research, and so on down. So the red indicates the rank, the order from top to bottom. But then what we did was we actually put in here the activity rank. So it's not a count, this is a rank in order. The most commonly reported activity was alerting and triage. And what if you just look at this chart, the things that are at the top with respect to the outsourcing are at the bottom with respect to the activity, with the exception here of this digital forensics. It is uh, very much out of this pattern. This security monitoring um, is frequently outsourced, and I'm going to get rid of all these little uh, uh, markers that I've put on here. Security monitoring is frequently outsourced, in my opinion, because there's actually a substantial value proposition that organizations have in terms of outsourcing that. And so this is frequently in a SOC, they will say that they've outsourced tier one, which is just the preliminary review to make sure that any given alert actually makes sense. From the staffing perspective, 
we asked about how big a sock is on average. And what's really interesting to me is that, and I've done this over a number of different years, this um, 2 to 10, 11 to 25 is always the highest numbers. And it actually isn't always correlated to the size of the organization. I've tried to slice this in different ways. And yes, generally, the larger size socks tend to be um, in larger organizations, but sometimes some of these socks that are reporting that they have between a hundred and a thousand people in the sock will be very small organizations. And I've done some work to try to understand some of these small organizations. These are usually uh, security operations centers, MSSPs, who actually are small and focused and are actually providing a service, and all of their staff is dedicated to that service. So there, there are some things where organization size doesn't very strongly indicate what the size of the SOC is going to be. 11 to 25 and 2 to 10 are the, uh, the most common ones. So when people ask me, how many people do I need in my SOC? My answer is always 10 because that's what the, uh, the representation that I have of what people are saying they tend to do is. Another thing that everybody has on their mind in terms of uh, this space is how to hire skilled people. And so we asked a number of questions about what sort of information the, uh, the managers are looking for in their hiring. So in the technical skill deficit that the hiring manager is attempting to fill includes things like information systems and network security. So this to me means lots of the, uh, the nomenclature and understanding of what needs to be done. Threat analysis, data analysis, and intelligence analysis are the next three, which says that they're looking for people who are capable of doing analysis. And in my experience, most people who are working in cybersecurity do not have training in analysis. So this was just an interesting thing that I saw in that and I thought, oh, everybody's looking for analysis in their staff hiring, but then they're not actually developing programs internally to curate and, and basically cultivate uh, an analytical approach in all of their staff. So I just wanted to call that out as a, as a potential issue uh, where they're seeking this thing by hiring people. And I think at least part of the solution is building that yourself as an ongoing program. In this particular space with cybersecurity operations centers, the average employment duration was one to three years. And uh, from some work that my uh, co-author John Pescator did, he said that this is actually aligned to industry average in uh, in IT. Um, the average uh, the average retention of th you know one to three years is not that uncommon for uh, for job roles. In order to minimize the turnover and make it so that we have good quality staff who understand how we work and who are going to stay with the organization, we ask the question, how do you retain staff? And this is pretty interesting. Money is not the highest answer that came through. Meaningful work just barely beat it and career progression beat it substantially in terms of how people in the SOC are saying that they're able to retain people. It's making it, making it feel like for an employee that they are making progress personally in their career that actually helps to retain them and stay there. Of course, remote work is nice. And as uh, all of us experienced recently, everybody got a taste of doing that almost everybody got a taste of doing that. So I asked the question whether they allowed it, and then also asked the question, if you do allow it, how do you decide who gets to work remotely? Because this is a big concern. And what they said was the specific role is part of it, uh, whether the data that is uh, going to be used for the, uh, for the uh, inspection will actually be protected as that data moves from wherever it was collected 
into the uh, the analyst's view. And so that's a big con concern. And then there's skill set and individually note, um, you know, negotiated and so on. So, of course, we talked a lot about technology in this. There's actually um, two major questions on technology, and there's a warning that those two questions actually take about 20 minutes, just those two questions alone. Um, and so we give people the option to not take those questions because it's so involved. We have an exhaustive list of, uh, of technology and ask about the, uh, the um, technology that they use. But we also asked specifically, what is the most important technology or tools for new hires to be familiar with? And again, this is specifically focused on SOC and people who work in the SOC. And so this EDR, XDR was the top one. SIM um, was the next one. And vulnerability remediation was after that. Now, I have this grouped in the questions in terms of host, network, um, analysis, and uh, and logging. There might be one other category just to, uh, to keep things organized. So in terms of the uh, technology, we ask it on an A through F scale. Oops. We ask it on an A through F scale, and we uh, found that uh, E, X, D, R, so E, D, R, or X, D, R, was absolutely at the top of the scale. However, the uh, the actual um, you know grade that came through was really only a B plus. Okay, so nobody got A's. The uh, the overall highest was uh, E D R X D R, um, email filtering, endpoint operating system logging, next gen firewall, and VPN were the top five. Can you guess what the bottom ranking was? I'm going to go to it in the slide. Go ahead and uh, get your get your guess ready, right? The biggest buzzword that's out there for uh, for this year, the bottom ranking in terms of technology satisfaction in the SOC was AIML. And it'll be interesting to see how this changes over the next couple of years. Uh, and this, I think, is an interesting barometer of it. Um, AIML actually, I think, has a number of really useful applications within cybersecurity operations. But it'll be interesting to see if that potential for application gets absorbed into the vendors or if it just ends up being an annoying chatbot and we end up having to program all this stuff in TensorFlow on our own in order to get the right sort of uh, data correlation, outlier detection, and the things that machine learning really should be doing to, uh, to help us. Uh, uh, so at the bottom, full PCAP, deception technologies, frequency analysis, pet uh, packet analysis, and artificial intelligence machine learning in order from highest to lowest. We also asked quite a bit about um, the technology as deployed. And so there's a huge chart, and I'm just pulling out a couple of uh, couple of elements related to that chart at the top of it. What I found, and it, it doesn't exactly correlate one to one at the top, but it, what I found is the things where there tends to be more satisfaction, there also is a higher likelihood that it gets deployed fully to production. Now, I can't say that one causes the other. I, I can't say that uh, uh, because I don't have enough support in the information that was collected to be able to say, well, that clearly is the relationship that's there. But this is something that, at least anecdotally from the, uh, the collection that I have, either you get it into full production and then you're satisfied, or you like the tool a lot, so you go through the pain to actually push it out there to get it into full production. And I mentioned this, and this is gonna be the last of the findings that I uh, speak to here. I mentioned this because it really speaks to our human nature in terms of how we operate, what we do, and how we uh, assess whether we like things or not, okay? And so this is, uh, this is a very quick recap of the uh, of the SOC survey that uh, ran this year, 
Uh, next year, uh, the questions will be available um, in the springtime. Um, so if you work in defense, blue team, security operations, please take the survey because I think that there's value to doing so, even though it is going to take you an hour and we're not going to pay you to do it. We're going to ask you to do it. But then there's stuff like this where there's information that can be shared in terms of uh, who's doing what and how they're doing it. And a lot of people come back to me and tell me that they actually get a lot of value from taking the survey. And then they also get a lot of value um, from reviewing it and then talking to their management about what sort of things they're going to do uh, for the future. I'm coming up on time here, but I just do want to include on the uh, on on the end what it would take if you wanted to do some of the analysis on your own. Um, I actually have uh, this Jupiter Lab notebook um, that's up here, and this is basically I actually. Um, if we scroll down through this, I have a ton of uh, stuff that I use and I share my raw notebook from that year's survey. And then as I do more talks after that, I sometimes refine things. Um, but I just talk about problems that I have during the exploratory data analysis. Um, I build out a number of, uh, you know, these uh, these seaborne plots. Um, I talk about the challenge of being able to do the GPA graphing and so on. So if you wanted to play around with this, what you would need to do is have Python installed. You would need to install Pandas because Pandas provides the uh, capability to actually do the data frame analysis, which is very much like a uh, which is very much like a spreadsheet um, in uh, in in uh, memory. Um, Yes, yeah, so there's a question in there. It says, this might be naive, but is there a chance to take a gander at the list of questions and answers of this survey? Wouldn't even dream of getting a copy of it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You can get the questions and the answers in this Excel spreadsheet that I am saying that you can do the analysis on. And I actually share that publicly because there was, uh, there, I do think that there's value in doing so because people can perform derivative analysis and answer some of their own questions. And the reason why I did that initially is, uh, is that there, um, there was a person who came to me and said, hey, Chris, I have all these questions, but I'm a, an enormous company, hundreds of thousands of endpoints. I don't really care what the 500 person company is doing. I only want to look at my peers who are in the financial industry and have 100,000 computers or more. And so I couldn't answer that directly because I hadn't really shared the uh, shared the data. There's another question in here about what are your insights regarding the change trends uh, in the answers over time? Uh, actually, what's interesting is that I think that there has not been a tremendous amount of change. And, and let me give you one example. The last three years, we've asked, what's your architecture? And for the last three years, basically the same ratio of people have said, in the next 12 months, we're going to move our SOC architecture to the cloud but the numbers haven't moved. So it's like people are expressing that they're planning to change architecture, but they're not actually accomplishing it, <laughs> right? So the capabilities haven't changed substantially. The outsourcing hasn't, has not changed substantially. What has changed over time though, is technology satisfaction. There has been actually a change over the last several years of what tools people like. And I think that that's the tool itself maturing. So um, let me just hit these last couple of things. It doesn't really matter, but I'm just going to put them into the uh, into the recording. Um, and uh, and I do want to uh, thank you all very much. Uh, my name is Christopher Crowley. Um, that's my Twitter handle. If you want to find me there, you can find me on LinkedIn. Hopefully, there was something that was insightful in this for you. Thank you very much, Christopher. It was a pleasure. Uh, to be a part of this session. Uh, I have a one question because we have, no more, we have no more questions from the chat, but yeah. I have one question. Uh, do you know which industry are doing the best, which, which type of industry, financial or, or something like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in terms of doing the best, 
That's a different project that I'm working. No, no, no. Okay. It's, it's a, so okay. so uh, you may actually know Rob Van Oost, the SOC CMM. He's actually working on maturity assessment work, and I do maturity assessments in a in a consulting engagement fashion. And actually, um, collaborating with Rob Van Oost, he's got a program where he's actually going to be aggregating statistics on uh, assessed maturity to be able to answer exactly that sort of question. This survey does not assess the okay. performance of the SOC. It is a questionnaire on what people are doing, but we're not actually going in and saying, okay, you scored you know, 6.7 out of a 10, but the work with um, SOC CMM, that's exactly what we're doing. And we're going to be able to present that. So that's, I think we may, you know, we may actually have uh, some information available for Black Hat of next year in Las Vegas is, uh, is where we're planning on debuting some of that stuff. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet you and be part of this session. Yeah. So, thank uh, you for having me. That's great. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.